All right, welcome to geometry. This is going to be our first lesson for the year. Um, we're going to start off with the basic building blocks of geometry. So we're the, our unit one is going to be all your basic terms and vocabulary that you're going to need for the entire school year. So this is going to be section 1.1. Also, feel free to, to uh, pause this video at any time if you're writing down your notes. Um, you can pause it anytime you want and just, you know, go back and forth, just like any normal video. Um, so make sure you write this title in your table of contents, section 1.1, Building Blocks of Geometry. And then we'll get started on the notes. So the undefined terms of geometry. The three undefined terms in geometry are your building blocks. So um, sometimes uh, I'll highlight some things. Those are things that you want to make sure you write down in your notes. If not, if you have the pre-printed notes, then it'll have all that for you. Okay. So the three undefined terms of geometry are your building blocks. So if we were to ever ask you that on a homework assignment, then that's what you would say. So what are these three undefined terms, these three building blocks? They are the point, line, and plane. And we're going to talk about what each one of those is. So a point, a line, and a plane. Not the plane that flies in the air, a different kind of plane. So let's talk about point first. That's your most basic building block of geometry. This is where it is all derived from. So a point has three, ex or three uh, explanations. It is an exact location in space. Okay, so an exact location. So think of um, like a little tiny particle. That's a point, one teeny tiny little particle. Um, it's zero dimensional, meaning it has no size. And you're going to name it with a capital letter because when you have your homework and your quizzes, we're going to have you name these points. Okay, so here's a here's an example. So like right here, um, let me get my pen. So right here, that little dot right there, that's a point. Okay, and I know it could be like a tiny circle, but we were trying to aim for it to be a point. So it's really technically, in the real world, very small, a tiny, tiny particle and it has a capital letter next to it. So the notation on how you would name it is just capital A. You don't even need a symbol or anything for this. Okay, and so you could have infinitely many points. Okay, so I'm drawing a bunch of points right here. And then of course they would have a name to it. Okay, so that's point A, like that could probably be point B, C, D, E, and so on. So you name them with a capital letter. So that's a point. Line, let's go to line, the second most basic building block of geometry. So a line is a little bit more to it. So this one has an infinite number of points that are blended together to form a straight line. And so they go extending forever and ever in opposite directions. So this is one dimensional, meaning like length, since it goes you know, left to right or up, down, however it's, it's facing. Um, you're going to name this with two capital letters. So you're going to be expected to name the lines that you see in a picture. And so you can pick any two points on the line. And there's another case where you can name it. If you see an italicized letter on, at, at the end of it, you can name it that way too. So here's the example on how you can name it. So first of all, here's a picture of a line. Okay. Now you're probably saying, well, what does that mean by infinitely many points blended together? So let me get my pen. So imagine if you had a point here and a point here and all these points. And of course, I can't. It's hard to draw it in a perfectly straight line. But infinitely many points that go on forever and ever. Okay. Eventually, when you blend them all together so much, it basically looks like it looks like a line. And they go forever that way. And that way. And now remember, there's infinitely many points. And so instead of drawing all these points, we just draw it like this picture above. Okay? But there's infinitely many points on my AD. So how do you name it? Here's how you're going to name it. Okay? You can name it this way, right here, AB, and you have to have that line symbol on top. 
or you can name it like that, just line M, and that's that italicized letter that I was talking about, okay? Some people flip the letters for some reason, and they'll put B first and A second, and that to me is the same thing as that, okay? So these two right here are the same. So that's line. Let's move on to the third most basic building block of geometry, and that's the plane. So it's kind of like jumps from, from smallest to largest. So here's what a plane is. A plane is a flat surface extending infinitely in all directions. It is two-dimensional, okay? It's got like a length and a width, so it spreads out, you know, one direction and, and the other direction. So it's like up, down, left, and right. And then... Um, you name it using at least three non-collinear points, and we'll talk about what collinear means in a little bit. You can probably guess what it means. Uh, but three non-collinear points or an italicized letter. So let's see what a picture of a plane looks like. This is a plane, this is a flat surface, okay? Also think of the floor of your house. The floor is a plane. The ceiling of your house, that's a plane. Anything that's a flat surface is a plane. So in your room right now, you probably got four planes that are easily visible, okay? You know, the ceiling, the floor, um, I'm sorry, six planes, the, the four walls going around you, okay? That's a basic room. I'm sure you probably have more walls if, if uh, you've got a different type of room. So that's basically a plane. And then you've got points all on there. So the points like right here, it's not drawn for you, but I just did it right now, like that's point P. And then and they won't always have a dot there. That's point L, that's point A, this is point D, okay? But they don't always necessarily have to have a dot. Now this one right here has a dot, that point C is on the plane, okay? So how do you name a plane? Because you're gonna have to name them. There's a couple ways you can name them. You can name them either like this, plane LAD, and so L, A, and D, those are not in a straight line because you've got one right here, one kind of going this way, like that. So that is not a straight line. So those are three good points to choose. And you're going to put that little symbol in front, okay? Or here's another way. Maybe your friend or somebody else, another student, would not name it using those particular three letters, and that's okay. You can use any letters, any points on the plane. You still use that same symbol, the little, it's just basically like a little four-sided figure, okay? And that represents plane. And then you can pick four letters sometimes. Remember, it's set up here just at least three points, okay? So this person, or this other way to write it is uh, plane P, A, C, D. So all of these points are not in a straight line, therefore you can use that. And that's what non-collinear means, not in a straight line. Okay, and then the third way to name it, it would be this way down here, plane M. You see that italicized letter in the corner? That right there is another way to name the plane. Okay, we're going to practice naming those on, on our homework. So that's a plane. So let's, since we had kind of briefly talked about collinear, what does collinear mean? Okay, collinear means points on the same line. Okay, and so... Anytime you just call out two points, those are automatically collinear. Even though the line may, need, may not be drawn, they still would be collinear because you could te technically connect them. So, for instance, E and D, E is not technically on, line, on, on the black line, line AC, but if I were to connect them like that, those could be collinear. So that's why this sentence is written right here. Two points are automatically collinear. But if we just go based off this picture right here, we would say that A, D, and C are collinear. Okay, because they're all on the black line. We could say that F and B are collinear. So A, D, and C are collinear, F and B are collinear. Okay. I mean, you could technically say E and F are collinear because that's just naming two points, okay? But we're going to stick to just what the picture shows, okay? So you always want to name what the picture shows. Okay, let's go to this next one, non-collinear. So basically the opposite of collinear. These are 
not on the same line. So these must uh, name at least three points because we had just said a second ago that two points are always collinear. So if I ask you to name points that are non-collinear with, um, with A, okay, so if I say which points are non-collinear with A, so points non-collinear with A. Which points are non-collinear with A? If you give me an answer of just um, B, if you say B only, well, that's technically wrong because we said that if we were to kind of draw a line like this, those are always collinear. Now, I know one's on the orange line and one's on the black line, but we have to name at least three points. So we got to say B and another one. So B and C. Okay, so B and C. So A, B, and C, this point, this point, and this point, those are non-collinear. Plus, if you were to try to connect them, you can kind of see that it makes a non-collinear. Uh, those three are not in the same line. Okay, another example um, could be uh, F, E, and D. You could name more than just two, okay? So line, uh, any points that are non-collinear with A would be A, F, E, and D. So like all of these, that does definitely not make a line. It they makes three, like a three-sided piece. Okay, so non-collinear, you gotta name at least three, okay? So A, B, and C is an example. A, F, and E, A, F, and D. A, F, and C. So as long as you have three, those could be non-collinear. Let's go to the next one. Coplanar. Coplanar. Coplanar means points on the same plane. Okay, on the same plane. Three points are always automatically coplanar. Okay, three points are always automatically coplanar. Okay, so we got a pretty challenging picture right here. We've got two planes here. We've got this flat plane right here that I just highlighted in blue. That's plane P, and the points that are on that plane are C, D, E, and two more. But you're probably wondering which ones. It's B and A, okay? So I'm gonna kind of put a red point there since the other ones are red. But remember I said at the intersections, they don't necessarily have to do a dot or a point, okay? So that is one plane. Okay, let me get a different color. Let's go with. This yellow. Here's your other plane, the one that's going up and down. Okay, and they're kind of like intersecting. So kind of like in your room, the floor and one of the walls, they intersect along that edge towards the bottom of your room. Or one of your walls and your ceiling. Your wall and your ceiling intersect at that top corner ledge all along that, that, that line. Okay, so these are different planes, so we need to pick the points. We have a little example right here. We need to pick the points that are coplanar with D. So we're going to name all the points that are on the same plane, okay, because that's what coplanar means, on the same plane with D. So that's the blue plane that I just highlighted. So remember I highlighted it blue a second ago. So D is on there. Now, there's a, a, something else that's unique with D. D is also on... The yellow plane that I highlighted. Why? How can that one point be on both planes? Because it's right at the intersection of both planes. Okay. So this line that I'm about to highlight in black right here, that line right there is where the blue plane intersects the yellow plane. So D is technically on both planes. So we have two groups that we could could name, but all you need is at least one. So let's focus on the blue plane. All the points that are on the blue plane are C, B, A, and E. So these are all the points that are coplanar with D. Okay. Now somebody else could answer something differently. Okay. So there's another answer. And that's the good thing about this geometry. You've got multiple things that could be represented. So the other ones that would be uh, coplanar with D are all the ones on the yellow plane. So that would be F, 
A and B, because remember, A and B are on both planes, and G. Okay, so there's two possible answers. You could either say all of these points in blue, because they're on that blue plane, or F, A, B, and G, because they're on the yellow plane. So you're probably wondering, well, what about H and I? Okay, those, we do not know what plane they're on. It looks like they could possibly be on an extension of the blue plane, but we don't know for sure, because remember, the blue plane can get extended to way out there. Okay, and so it looks like that could be on there, but we don't know for sure what plane they are, so we can't include H or I on that. Okay, so right now they're just in space somewhere over here. Okay, so that's coplanar. Let's do the opposite of coplanar. Opposite of coplanar is non-coplanar. That means these are not on the same play, plane. So you must list at least four points in this category because three points are always coplanar. So kind of like similar to the line. Remember on the line, two points were always collinear. So we have to name three. Well, this is one more point. <clears throat> So same picture, okay, so we've got the, the flat plane and then the vertical plane. So it's asking which points are, are co oh, this one's supposed to be non-coplanar. Okay, so they put a little non-coplanar there. Okay, which points are non-coplanar with G? Non-coplanar. And so that's our first point right there, okay? So that's our first point, G, and we have to list at least three more because remember up here it says four or more. So three more points we need to list. So right now, just to give you a bad example, if you were to say E is non-coplanar with G, that would be incorrect because we gotta have a group of four at least, okay? Even though E is on this plane right here and G is on that yellow plane, which well, I'm gonna just do red. So G is on plane R, E is on plane P. You can't only list one because we have to list a group of four. So we can say E, we can say C, anything that's on the blue plane, because G is on plane R. We can even list H, because that's way out there. We don't know which plane is on that one, okay? So that's a good example. You're, there's infinitely many answers on this one. We could say I, H, and D, okay? Now, even though D is on the same plane, you included I and H in that group, therefore, that is a group of points that are non-coplanar, okay? So, again, there's many, many answers. One person, one student might say that group, one student might say that group, another student could say a whole other group. So there's, again, infinitely many answers, but all you need is one. Okay. And you can name more than just three. You can do that. But I was just doing the minimum of four points. And G is included as points. So G, E, C, and H are non-coplanar. Sorry for that typo. Okay. Let's go on to the next vocabulary word. Line segment. Line segment. So here's what a line segment is. It sounds like line, but it's got something to it. So it's two endpoints and all the points in between. Okay, this is part of a line, and so you name it using the two endpoints of the line segment. So you have to name everything. So I have two examples of some segments. Okay, one is drawn one, one way and one is drawn another way, a part of the line. Okay, so I'm going to highlight this. This right here is, segment, is a segment, and this right here is a segment. Okay, those are both examples of segments. Now this picture down here, okay, that is technically a line CD as well. But remember the definition is uh, it is part of a line, okay? So this segment, we're just focusing on that yellow section, okay? So it definitely has a beginning and an ending, okay? Here's how you name it, okay? You name it using two capital letters, okay, which I said these two are the same right here, so I don't expect you to name both of these ways, okay? That, that is represented as the same, A, B, B, A, okay? But you'll notice the symbol, it's different from the line. It is different from the line. Okay, so this these names go with this picture right here, okay? Now this right here is segment DC. 
Okay, that one goes with that picture right there. That is represent a segment, which is completely different from if I were to say this right here. If I put the little arrows on the end of it, that means line, okay? That's not the same thing as a segment. That means line, something totally different. A line goes on forever and ever. A segment does not. It has a beginning. So there are two ways to name this segment. Oh, gosh. Okay, sorry about that. They're sending us announcements at school. So naming a segment, it has a definitely be beginning and an ending. So it's a certain size. When a line has an infinite length, it goes on forever and ever. That the line technically has no size to it, okay? So imagine kind of like, I don't know, a railroad track. If it was straight, that is. I know railroad tracks curve, but you know how railroad tracks kind of go on forever and ever. And then eventually they do, they do end, but if you were to just look at it, you know, closely, it goes on forever and ever into the next city, perhaps even into the next state, you know, long ways. So that's like kind of goes on forever and ever. And then and then I know it does end, but in in geometry world, a line never ends. Okay? So it's infinitely forever long. All right, let's go to the next one. Congruent. I'm sure you've heard of the word congruent before. We're going to use that continuously throughout the year. Um, this means to be the same size and shape. Okay. And so the shape, when we get into shapes, uh, you can flip and turn them and rotate and they can still be congruent, okay? So they may not look perfectly the same right next to each other, but they could still be the same given, you know, some symbols. Um, here's a symbol that we use for the word congruent. Um, it's basically an equal sign with a little wavy line on top, okay? So if you see the symbol right here, it means congruent. Okay, so then let's talk about congruent segments. We define what a segment is, and then now we talk about what congruent is. So when we talk about congruent segments, these are uh, gonna be two or more segments that have the same length or measure, okay? Same length or measure. So I have an example of some congruent segments. It doesn't show the measure, but it does show these tick marks. Let me get my highlighter. So you see this tick mark right here, and this tick mark in here, they're red. That is a symbol that signifies that they are congruent, and I'm sure you've seen them before in middle school. Okay, so that definitely states that they are congruent. If they do not have the tick marks, then they will have something um, that shows a measure of some sort, like maybe three inches. Okay, so if they, they have to have some sort of marking, whether it's with uh, measurements or with those tick marks. Okay. And so now using the symbol, the way we would write that out, we would say segment OC is congruent to segment UR. And so notice the symbols that they're using to name it. You have to name it that way. Okay, that's the correct notation. So those are congruent segments. So keep an eye out for tick marks because that signifies that they are congruent. Segment addition. Segment addition. So when we work with segments, we can, you know, add two and they can equal a larger one. So if we have points A, B, and C, so A, B, and C, let me get my highlighter, that'll be better. So three points. And they are collinear. What does collinear mean again? On the same line. And B is in the middle somewhere, meaning in between. And B is in between A and C. Then we have this segment addition rule right here. Okay, so let me show you what that picture is. That'll look a little bit better. So here's some segments. They're all collinear. And so we have this segment here, AB. We have a different segment over here, BC. Okay, if we were to add those two together, then that's going to equal segment AC, which is the whole big segment like that, which is green. Okay, so... Here's AB, which I just put a simple number to it, 5. If I add it to BC, which is 8, then segment AC is going to be 13. Okay, so that's segment addition. We're going to do that with some examples, and we're going to throw in some algebraic expressions to help you remember your algebra. Another definition called midpoint. Midpoint 
is basically how it sounds. It's a point in the middle. So it's the point on the segment that is the same distance from both endpoints. It's the exact same distance from both endpoints, okay? The word bisect is what we're gonna use all year long too. So it bisects the segment. So if you ever hear uh, your teacher say, oh, this is a bisector or this bisects something, that means it's cutting it right in the middle to be the same distance from both endpoints. So right here, we have this point A and it's in the middle. Now look, right now, I want you to notice that we it looks like it's in the middle, but we don't technically know the size of each side. It doesn't say how big this is, and it doesn't say how big this is. So we can't assume that it's a midpoint yet, okay? So let me get rid of those. However, if I put a tick mark here and a tick mark here, we talked about what tick marks mean, that means now that this segment, LA, is the same distance or same length as segment AS. So now A is a midpoint. Okay. But I want you to remember that because if these tick marks are not on the segment, don't assume that point A is in the middle. Okay, But since we're talking about midpoint and its definition, let's put the tick marks there. Okay, and So here's a notation again using the congruent symbol. Segment LA is congruent to segment SA or AS. Remember, you can flip-flop these letters and it still means the same thing right here. You could say AL or LA, same difference. Okay, so that's midpoint. And definition of ray, okay? A ray is basically a combination of a segment and a line together. So it is part of a line. And so it's part of a line that has a definite beginning and an indefinite ending. Okay, so it's a combination of a segment and a, and a line. Okay, so if I have a starting point, then I'm going to go forever in one direction. Okay, this is going to be named a certain way. For some reason, this has a critical way, the way you name it. Okay, you name it with the endpoint first, and the arrow notation must go to the right. Okay, so here's an example of what a ray is. Let me get my highlighter. So it starts right here at C, and then it goes forever. In that direction okay that's that's ray C S okay why did I say C first because just like I said up here you have to name it with the endpoint first you have to say ray C S if you were to say ray S C that's not correct because it doesn't go infinitely in that direction okay because it has an endpoint right here on C that's an endpoint <clears throat> so, let me get rid of this one because that's wrong. Oops. So, it doesn't go in that direction. It goes in this direction over here. So, how do you name it? You name it. You name it with C first then S, and then you put the symbol with the arrow going to the right. Okay, so I'm gonna highlight that part as well. Arrow notation must go to the right. Okay, and so sometimes it gets a little difficult on naming uh, rays if you have a pretty, a pretty big line segment. So let me draw a, an example of how it could be a little bit more difficult. So if I have a line like this, and I have one, two, Four points on the line. Let's say this is point A, B, C, and D. Now let me get my highlighter and show you the different rays that we could have. Okay, we could have ray CD, and it goes forever that way. We could have ray CA, because it goes forever that way. Which that's a, a couple of ways you can name that one. You can say ray CA or CB. You could have a ray B, D, where it starts at B and goes forever to the right. You could have a ray A, D, where it starts at A and it goes forever to the right. Okay, so there's different ways you can name that. All right, so let me get my pen and show you the different ways. So 
um, CD, that's one ray, the blue one. The pink one over here, I could say ray CA and ray CB. Those are the same right there. Okay, so these are the same ray. So if one student names it CA, one student names CB, they're both right. Okay, those are both correct answers because those are the different points. Some people are probably saying, well, why are we using B? Because it stops right there. But yes, we're using the symbol for ray, so it starts at C and it goes forever in that direction. Okay, it doesn't stop right there. It keeps going and going infinitely long in one direction. Um, what's the other one? The green one. The green one would be ray B, C, or ray B, D. Just like I just talked about a while ago, this is the same ray, that green one that I highlighted, B, C, or B, D, because it goes forever in the direction to the right. So see, it can get a little challenging on these, uh, on these rays right here. Okay, so I just wanted to extend on that. But the way you name it is with two letters and the arrow has to go to the right. Okay. Okay, so these are just some examples and the rest were definitions. I know it's a lot, but we gotta remember to study and just reread them, okay? All right, so we have two segments here. We have segment AB and segment CD. What do we know about these segments? We have that little tick mark right there, which means what, everybody? It means that they are congruent. So, let me get my pen. It says AB is represented by 3x plus 12. So I'm gonna put a 3x plus 12 right here. And it says CD is represented by 7x minus 16. So I'm gonna put that there. And it says solve for x, and then find the length of each segment. So what we're gonna do there is, since they are equal to each other, okay, because they're congruent segments, that means these two are equal. So if we want to use algebra to solve for x, we're going to say 3x plus 12 equals 7x minus 16. Okay? And this is an algebraic uh, equation that you can solve for in probably a couple of steps. So what would we do first? We would probably subtract 3x from both sides and it'll cancel out there. So we're left with 12 on the left equals 4x minus 16. Okay, and then to get x by itself, we probably want to add 16 to both sides to get rid of it over here. And so now we have 28 on the left equals 4x. We're gonna divide by four on both. And four goes into 28. How many times? Seven times. So x equals seven. Okay, that's what x is. And then it says what's the length of each segment? Well, we want to plug it back in to over here. So it's three times seven plus the twelve. So three times seven is twenty-one. Twenty-one plus twelve is thirty-three. So the measure of each segment is thirty-three. Okay, and since they're congruent, CD is also 33 units. Okay, so that's using algebra and geometry together at once, working with congruent segments. Let's go to this next one. This next one, we have three collinear points, meaning A, B, and C are on the same line, okay, or segment in this case, because so the segment is part of a line, that's why I can say line. So it says A, B, get a different color. It says AB is 2x minus 9, so from here to here is 2x minus 9. And then it says BC is 3x plus 17. BC from there to there is 3x plus 17. And then it has AC is 43, so from here all the way to there is 43. So how are we going to solve for x and to get us to get to a, the length of a, b, and b, c? 
Well, this involves that segment addition, okay? So I'm gonna show you with my highlighter like I did last time. So this segment plus this segment is going to equal the whole entire segment. So let's go ahead and set that up. We have 2x minus 9 plus 3x plus 17 equals 43. So now we have an equation to solve. So your first step is going to want to be to combine like terms. Okay? So we have these two like terms that we want to combine. So we have 5x on the left plus 8 equals 43. Now we're going to subtract 8 from both sides. So we have 5x equals 35. Divide by 5 and x equals 7. x equals 7. And so we have to solve for AB. So what we want to do with 7 is plug it in. Okay. So if AB is equal to 2x minus 9, if we plug in 7 right there, we're doing 14 minus 9. And so what is 14 minus 9? 5. So AB is equal to 5. Okay, and so if this is 5, we can do an easy subtraction to get BC. So what is 5 subtracted from 43? 38. So BC is 38 units long. Okay, now some of you are probably thinking like, no way, that does not look like 5 and that does not look like 38. So in geometry, nothing is ever drawn to scale. Okay, so this picture is totally not drawn to scale and it's probably not drawn to scale to try to trick you. But I, I guess technically if you wanted to redraw it, the point would be a lot closer to this side, maybe something like that. That would be more drawn to scale. So that would be A, B, and C. Okay. All right, that's using segment addition. Okay, let's try one more. I believe that's the last one. Yes, let's try one more. So this one's unique. This right here, B, is a midpoint. Why is it a midpoint? Because we have this tick mark here and this tick mark here. So that's saying that this segment, AB, is the same size as BC. So these are equal congruent segments. So let's see what they give us. Let me get my pen and let's label now. So it says AB is 7x, okay, so I'm going to put 7x right here, and then it says AC is 12x plus 36. So from here to here is 12x plus 36. Hmm, so how would we attempt to do this one? Well, one thing that you should probably notice is that if this segment right here is 7x. Well, shouldn't this segment right here also be represented as 7x? Because we did say that they were congruent, so we're about to write 7x right there. So now it becomes a segment addition, okay? So I get a lot of kids wanting to subtract 7x from 12x plus 36, and then that leads them to 5x plus 36, but then they don't know what to do after that. So don't get caught up on subtracting those, okay? I mean, you can, but you have to extend it a little bit different, okay? So now, since we have both of those represented as 7x, the whole thing, so from here to here, could be represented as 14x, correct? Because 7x plus 7x is 14x. So then we could say 14x equals 12x plus 36. So we have a representation for the whole, the whole entire segment, AC. So I'm going to go ahead and subtract um, 12x from both sides. I'm get a smaller pen. So I'm going to subtract 12x from both sides. So I get 2x equals 36. Divide by 2, and x is going to equal 18. Okay, so now I have x, and so now I'm just going to plug it in to figure out what the actual length of bc is. So 18 times 7 is 126. So segment BC is equal to 126 units. 
Okay. So you solve for x first and then you plug it in to get the segment. 